morning and welcome to yet another session of the NPTEL course, Introduction to World Literature. Today we are looking at this age old iconic text titled The Epic of Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh is an epic tale from ancient Mesopotamia and it is also regarded as the earliest surviving great work of literature and this has been classified as one of the earliest and one of the greatest works of uh, world literature in its truest sense. And this is even considered as the Mesopotamian Odyssey, but this was written uh, about 1500 years even before Homer wrote Iliad. So, it is, so the text is that ancient, it is an age old text considered as the earliest of world literature. It was originally written in Akkadian language and it tells a tale of the Sumerian Gilgamesh, the hero king of Uruk, Uruk being one of the Mesopotamian city states and his adventures. So, the tale is entirely about the, uh, the, the, the epic journeys and the great adventures that Gilgamesh, the king of Uruk, uh, went through. The manuscript of this text, that, uh, the epic tale of uh, Gilgamesh, the epic of Gilgamesh, it was discovered in the ruins of the library of Ashurbanipal in Nineveh by the archaeologist Homs Rasim. This was in 1853, towards the end of the 19th century. So, it is very significant and important to remember that this text gets the attention of the modern audience only from the 20th century onwards. And to be precise only after the first world war, we find critical and historical attention being given to this text, its reception and its circulation during a time which is which dates back to more than uh, about 3500 to 4000 years. And, uh, when this manuscript was discovered, it was found that it is written in a cuneiform uh, script on 12 clay tablets and it also dates from around 1300 to 1000 BC. So, I want you to keep in mind that the significance of this text is not just literary, it is not just aesthetic, beyond that it serves a larger historical and archaeological function as well. It is in such a context that we begin to look at the Epic of Gilgamesh as an iconic text in world literature which also tells us about the significance of such works even before the term was coined, even before the discourse on literature or uh, literary tradition or even world literature came into being. So, this was the uh, one of the clay tablets that was discovered and it is uh, it continues to be preserved in its original form in London. Along with the epic uh, poem of Gilgamesh, a set of other five poems were also found and the gaps in the tablets, we, we, they, they did not really get a continuous set of tablets which had the original text inscribed. It took a lot of effort, massive effort uh, by various historians, uh, uh, literary people and uh, archaeologists trying to fill in the gaps in the tablets by various fragments found not just in one spot, but uh, in uh, various parts of Mesopotamia and Anatolia. So, this text the whatever remnants of the text are now available, the ways in which it has been translated also needs to be seen in that context. One needs to be attentive to the vast number of centuries that passed in between the time that it was originally written and it was uh, discovered and translated and circulated again. I want to take you through the, the summary or the important uh, things that are part of this epic poem. In the first half, we are introduced to Gilgamesh, who is also the central character of this epic poem. He is a handsome, athletic young king of uh, Uruk city, but he is also very cruel and arrogant. He does not come across as a good person, a good ruler. And uh, he does things like challenging young men to contest and combat. He even proclaims his right to have sexual intercourse with all new brides. So, he is unleashing terror in the city of Uruk. He also has a semi divine origin. This also ties up well with the mythical narrative and the, uh, the dialogue between gods and human beings throughout this uh, uh, poem. And uh, he has a semi divine origin, his mother being the goddess Ninsun and father the priest king um, Lugal Banda. So, this is the way in which we are being introduced to Gilgamesh in the first half of the uh, poem. And Uruk citizens are retired of this terrible ruler, they want to get rid of uh, Gilgamesh and they ask for God's help. Gods play a very significant role in this poem throughout. We find gods even taking human forms, human attributes and that is what makes this text very enduring in a certain way to a modern audience. 
And um, in response to Uruk citizens seeking God's help, they sent him Enkidu, who is a wild man. He is sent to the city of Uruk to challenge Gilgamesh. He is a wild man. He does not know how to live in a civilized society. We also find a woman who is teaching him the ways of the civilized world, right, from teaching him how to eat. When he meets Gilgamesh, and uh, there's a long encounter over there, and they get into a fight, and Gilgamesh wins the fight. Uh, but, uh, but the story, the tale begins to take a twist from then on, and Gilgamesh and Enkidu become good friends, and they s set out on this great adventure, which also parts a significant um, section of the first half. So, through a series of events, which we shall not be discussing now, they end up killing the bull of heaven. And for this, God punished Gilgamesh by the death of Enkidu. And this is how the first half comes to an end. And in the second half, we find Gilgamesh setting out on a new journey, a new quest. And this time, it's for immortality. He's deeply mourning Enkidu's death. He's asking very pertinent questions about life, about death, about immortality. And we find him trying to engage with the philosophical questions that men and women are trying to ask even today. So in the tale, we get to know that Gilgamesh looks for, he's searching for uh, Utnapishtim. He's an immortal man who survived the Great Flood and the Great Flood here is presented as a precursor to the Biblical Noah. There are also a number of uh, scholars who believe that the Biblical uh, floods during the time of Noah is also, the, the storyline is also inspired by uh, the Great Flood which gets documented in this uh, work, uh, the Epic of Gilgam Gilgamesh. So he meets um, Utnapishtim and Utnapishtim tells him to accept his mortality. And this text assumes a very philosophical undertone at this point. It, it stops being just a tale of adventure. It stops being just the story of Gilgamesh, but it begins to ask universal questions which continue to resonate even in the contemporary. Uh, when uh, Utnapishtim tells him to accept his mortality and tries to convince him that it cannot be changed, that it's a, a very uh, pertinent uh, section where he also tells him, and this is of course from one of the translations, life which you look for you will never find. For when the gods created man, they let death be his share and life withheld in their own hands. So this is the kind of profound discussion that we can find in this text which dates back to more than 1500 years even before Homer's Iliad. And uh, after this life-changing quest and this encounter with uh, Utnapishtim, we find Gilgamesh returning to Uruk, a changed man. He becomes a good king and uh, the documents tell us that he ruled for 126 years. And this is the way in which the epic poem is structured. So it is about many things rolled into one. And if we try to take a quick look at some of the important themes. Firstly, this text is important for our understanding of Mesopotamia and kings. There is a historical significance which is of no doubt. But apart from that, there is a timeless universal idea of, of friendship, the ideas of kingship, enmity, mortality, death, male-female relationships about the way in which the contrast between city and the rural life is positioned, about civilization and the wild, about this dialogue and this relation, this uh, very ambivalent relation between gods and humans, we find all that becoming important themes and important uh, elements throughout this uh, uh, text. And about the figure of Gilgamesh, and uh, he's not entirely a mythical imaginative figure. He is a historical king of Uruk. He appears in, uh, in contemporary letters and inscriptions found by archaeologists. So there's every reason to believe that there was such a king named Gilgamesh. Uh, but, but of course, to suit the aesthetic uh, elements in this epic tale, he also becomes a semi-divine hero of Mesopotamia. And the story also makes him go through many challenges, face many challenges and come out successful through that to make him the mature hero that he becomes at the end of the story and also make him a good. So that's a dramatic element that is being infused into the historical, into the real so that it continues to remain fantastical, universal and has to have uh, an appeal in multiple ways.
Some critics are of the opinion that this work had a substantial influence on Homer. Uh, if you are interested in knowing more about this, you are welcome to read uh, Martin West's work, The East Face of Helic and West Asiatic Elements in Greek Poetry and Myth. There he argues that the poem combines the power and tragedy of the Iliad with the wanderings and marvels of the Odyssey. It is a work of adventure, but, is it, but it is no less a meditation on some fundamental issues of human existence. And this is one of the elements that also make the Epic of Gilgamesh a world literature, a world uh, literary text in the truest sense. More than the many parts that make this text the Epic of Gilgamesh, what I find very fascinating and interesting is the positioning of Gilgamesh in world literature. Here we have an epic written more than 3,500 years ago by a Babylonian poet. Uh, this is in what is now Iraq. And this was originally written in one of the Sumerian languages. There are numerous interpretations and this is perhaps the greatest living text in world literature which continues to undergo translations and multiple interpretations. And in Mads Thompson's words, it fascinates by giving access to a society that is no more but whose complexity and both joys and sorrows of daily life shine through. So this is something extremely fascinating and incredible about this text Gilgamesh, the, the original literary tradition within which it was part of, the original context within which that was part of, the society which produced this Turks text in the first place is no more. And we get an access to this story and to this that context and to that tradition which is no longer there and at the same time the many elements from that context, <coughs> from that life which continues to be shared in this text, uh, it, it, it remains very relevant and uh, almost universal. And, uh, and, and there is a section where we find uh, Gilgamesh mourning the loss of immortality when he is also mourning the death of uh, Enkidu. He is asking very pertinent questions about life, about death and he is searching immortality because uh, that strikes him, death strikes him as a reality that the life that he is leading, the seemingly adventurous, the seemingly powerful and even the wicked life that he is dealing it, it seems to be of no worth if it is not immortal. And this is the section which uh, tells us about the way in which Gilgamesh is mourning the loss of immortality. Then Gilgamesh sat down and wept. Down his cheeks the tears were coursing. He spoke to Urshanabi the boatman, for whom Urshanabi toiled my arms so hard, for whom ran dry the blood of my heart. So it's also a very sensitive uh, epic. It is very emotional in many of its sec segments. And uh, very soon we find Gilgamesh, King Gilgamesh, moving from feelings of disappointment of uh, not achieving immortality because he is also convinced that death is part and parcel of this life. From that we find him moving towards the beauty of the dynamic and complex society that he rules over. And he begins to see his position as a ruler in a, from a different perspective, in a totally different light altogether. And this is the change, this is the magnificent shift that we uh, face in the second section, in the second part of the poem, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. In the first half, we find Gilgamesh taking pleasure, almost a wicked kind of a pleasure from ruling his people, from completely suppressing them and taking charge of things which he ethically should not, controlling things and overpowering things in a way that he should not. But in the second half we find him, this is, this is the section which comes towards the end of the poem and we find him taking comfort in the walls that he has built around the great city. I read to you a brief excerpt. When at last they arrived, Gilgamesh said to Urshanabi, this is the wall of Uruk, which no city on earth can equal. See how its ramparts gleam like copper in the sun. Climb the stone staircase more ancient than the mind can imagine. Approach the Anna temple, sacred to Ishtar, a temple that no king has equaled in size or beauty. Walk on the wall of Uruk, follow its course, round the city, inspect its mighty foundations, examine its brickwork, how masterfully it is built. Observe the land it encloses, the palm trees, the gardens, the yards, the glorious palaces and the temples, the shops, the marketplaces, the houses, the public squires. This is how it goes. So towards the end, when his perspective is entirely changed, when he comes to terms with the immortality that is part of his life, 
that the knowledge that death is part of the very life that he has, he begins to appreciate the work of his hands. He begins to appreciate the, what he can see as the outcome of his life. And when he is admiring and taking comfort in the walls that he has built around the great city, the Epic of Gilgamesh is also telling us that there's another way in which immortality can be achieved. It is through the works that you leave behind. And here Gilgamesh is looking at the walls, the staircase, things magnificent and small. And he's even ex uh, looking at very minute things like, like brickwork and the masterful uh, plan that has gone into it and the nature around it and how organically he has managed to put everything together. And this is perhaps the greatest message that the Epic of Gilgamesh also leaves with us towards the end, that immortality is in the works that you produce, in the, the societies and the lives and the many things that you build around you, whether they are in the form of walls or in the form of relations or in the form of the legacy or the value system that you leave behind, that is the way to immortality and we find Gilgamesh a changed person and a good ruler and a mature person truly emerging as a hero with this realization and to think that such a profound text existed about 3500 years back that itself is a very unique contribution it, that itself is a very unique way to approach uh, world literature from the contemporary and this text, Gilgamesh has been increasingly seen as a unique world literature text. It's a unique case in international canonization because this is one such text which is now not supported, cannot be supported by the reception of a living literary culture. One is not even aware of the literary culture in which it was produced and how it was received and circulated then. There are only certain conjectures which lead us to assume that perhaps the text was uh, translated and circulated at least in some parts uh, in and around Mesopotamia and Sumeria. This work in the modern times, what makes it very, very unique and significant is that it, it has been read always only in translation. So this also brings us to the, some of the questions about translation, about the original text and the role that a translated text plays. And uh, we find these texts and the, uh, the ways in which these texts are being brought back to life, we find them asking newer questions, interesting questions and more challenging questions about the idea of translation and the practice of translation. What makes it all the more uh, unique in the case of Gilgamesh is that this text is often, sometimes not even often, almost always read only in scholarly context. And it's, an, it's a text which is primarily of academic interest and through this academic interest the entry point is scholarly academic for sure but through this it also makes it possible to present a text that is both a cultural and religious document and also an aesthetic achievement so this is a unique way in which uh, the epic of Gilgamesh is being presented but this does not take away the impact on the general reading public either. That is what makes this text a unique kind of a text in international canon and also in the tradition of world literature. And the Epic of Gilgamesh is one of the very few texts which also showcases the openness of the Western canon. And it also tells us that it is not very important to know about the original literary tradition to be able to appreciate a work at a different point of time. And these are again, this text is again one of those texts where one does not bother about the source from where the text came, whether it was the handiwork of one person or a group of uh, writers, whether it was handed down as an oral tradition and then noted down by various people, it really does not matter. And this talks us about, this tells us about the inclusiveness and the openness of canon, which at some level is one of the important ideas that world literature should celebrate as well. So as we wrap up this discussion, I also want you to stay alert to the fact that this document, this uh, text, Epic of Gilgamesh, is also seen as a document of a genuinely ancient humanism. And this is a kind of humanism that extends beyond humanity to include gods as well. That's what we see in this text. That's what we see in its presentation and its framework. 
And uh, in that context, when we read through the text, we are also being introduced to God's generosity, fickleness, hatred, hatred, and almost all expressions are expressed in human terms. And it remains closer to mankind for that reason and for the universal, the timeless appeal that it makes in terms of life, death, and questions of immortality. This being a text that reads the modern audience after the Second World War, there's a lot of uh, contemporary work which could be accessed on Gilgamesh. If you are interested in reading more about the context within which um, Gilgamesh was found and how it made its way to become a great literature, or to become one of the greatest literatures of, uh, as part of world literature, you may want to take at these two. Uh, you may want to take a look at these two books. A more recent one being Theodore Ziolkovsky's work, which came out in 2011, Gilgamesh Among Us: Modern Encounters with the Ancient Epic. Uh, some of the uh, excerpts can be ex accessed online, and there is also this work by David Dombrosch. David Dombrosch also being one of the theorists of world literature in the contemporary, one of the most renowned theorists of world literature. His 2007 work, The Barred Book, The Loss and Rediscovery of the Great Epic of Gilgamesh. I hope this lecture will also encourage you to access the text and also look at the ways in which texts are not just translated and circulated, but they are also being made accessible through these different modes of practices, different sciences like history or archaeology or uh, even translation practices. And therein lies the significance of a text like the Epic of Gilgamesh. I thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you in the next session.